we've got um a vote coming up which i didn't want to focus on too much just because i want people to backdate like watch it in a year and this this you know but a lot of these things will still be relevant which is that uh we've got two parties that everyone you know labor and conservatives for and i know people outside of britain might not know but it's it's republicans and democrats basically a bit different um but it sounds like reform which is nigel farage's party uh might make some sort of impact we don't know how much we don't know how much people are just annoyed and they're saying it and then they won't actually vote or anything like that but he's seen i think as a populist i don't know what populism necessarily actually means anymore i saw winston marshall doing a great speech um the debate with nancy pelosi and he actually because i went in going come on this uh, come on and then i thought oh you know what maybe he's got a point what is populism so i would i would i uh, i would first I, I think give you a few examples of, of where i actually perhaps became more comfortable with people attaching that to to someone like me, for example, or or uh, the voting patterns of my family, uh, who have been through the whole, um, uh, the the changing of the electoral roadmap, where if if you come from a background like mine, you labour, right? You, you put a red rosette on a donkey and it would have won in County Durham. Mm. Uh, still the case in most parts of County yeah. Durham, to be fair, but you get the point. Now, though, their their voting patterns have have changed and moved more culturally right, but that's what the old Labour Party used to be like. Um, so, whether it be on the trans issue or whatever else, they all see, view this as a bit mad and alien. Um, and I, I would put it down to things like Hillary Clinton's uh, basket of deplorables. You know, they're the ones voting for Trump. Mm. Uh, anyone that voted for Brexit is, as David Lammy, who's about to be our uh, foreign secretary, potentially, uh, he compared Brexiteers to Nazis. Yeah. Um, they are uh, racist. They are bigoted, they are small-minded, uneducated. I remember I did a debate on Channel 4 and it was the... Uh, day after or not long after the referendum itself and I ca I campaigned for Brexit mm. and I was told by a former vice chairman of the Conservative Party that I was uneducated and that's why I voted the way I did mm. and I I don't have a degree so I guess in that in that purely in crude sense, yeah, I guess I am uneducated compared to someone high and mighty like her. Mm. Oh, she's got a good point then. Right, see you, mate. Yeah, exactly. That's it. End yeah. of the podcast. I was a Remainer, and I think I still would. I still would be now. And but I have respect for democracy. Yeah, and I understand that not everybody who disagrees with me is a Nazi. Yeah, and and wanting to to actually use democracy to uh, argue for the nation state to argue that the nation state is the best vehicle to protect our rights and protect uh, the advancement of, of uh, working class issues because they would argue that globalism hasn't, although it's had benefits as far as, you know, again, uh, if we go back only, what, 100 years, I could have died in childbirth, you know? That, that's what, that was your lot. Um, capitalism has been great for advancing all of these technologies and healthcare initiatives that we take for granted now but there is a sense of the size of everything that you're caught up in your your daily lives becoming bigger and things happening to you and the individual becoming a hell of a lot smaller and the individual feeling incredibly powerless uh disenfranchised uh, ostracized isolated and i think those are the voters who are saying and they did this in 2016 in both Brexit and Trump. They did it a year earlier when 4 million people voted for UKIP. They did it in 2009 when some people voted for the BNP, who, by the way, I think are awful. Nick Griffin has called me out on, on Twitter for, for being a, a Zionist shill or something to that effect. He's a bastard. Uh, yeah, he is. He's a horrible, fat ogre. And... Uh, uh, I, I would rather that people didn't vote for parties like that. So if if being populist is actually ensuring that 
you strengthen the nation state, you strengthen the individual, you give people purchase over their own lives, you allow them to feel that they are part of the democratic system and it isn't something that's just happening to them. Or people in Westminster are so far removed from you that they might as well be in goodness only knows what, Elon Musk's new space centre in Mars or something like that. Uh, all of those things are what they, they term populist. I would describe myself as a national conservative. I think national populism, if you want to call it that, fine. But I think it all centers around the nation state and ensuring that you don't become a product of, and I, you saw this in no clearer than the European elections, the most recent ones, where Marine Le Pen and the alternative for Deutschland uh, in Sweden, the, 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 the New Democrats, I think they're called, and then uh, Holland, a whole load of places where there was a, a populist revolt, where the people said, I'm, I ain't putting up with this anymore. And the EU's response through Ursula von der Leyen, who's the European head of the European Commission, she turned around and she said, we will basically unite against a uh, former bloc, against the extremes of left and right. So that to me was them saying, we will once again put our head in the clouds or so far up our own bottoms that uh, I hope it smells nice up there because they refuse point blank to accept that those plebs might have a point, those deplorables might have a point, that actually maybe life is getting worse for people like that. And that's why you're seeing this groundswell of an activist base where young people, the next generation, are voting for the so-called far right because they're saying, my future is harmed by the fact that we are uh, becoming part, swallowed up by some European entity. We are uh, allowing mass migration to come here uh, in places like London, but other European capitals. You see in support for gay rights, for example, mm -hmm. to decrease. There's some studies that suggest that that's on, on the on the downward trajectory. And all of this can be linked to a globalist pursuit of hyperliberalism. And it's not working for people. And if you want to call that populist, call it whatever you want. I don't care. But I'm on the side of those people. I'm on the side of making life better for them. Because if you want to get a house, if you want to get a doctor's appointment, if you want to uh, get a job even, my, my brother's in and out of, he's 11 months younger than I am. My mother apparently couldn't hang about. And uh, he's in and out of factory work. And uh, he's always competing with people from, other parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, and they're able to work that are willing to work for wages lower than what he would be expecting in a field like a uh, welding and manufacturing working with your hands is an incredibly uh rewarding thing for a, for a man to do you know my grandfather was a miner mm. uh my mother was brought up in an era where concert where I was born has a had a steelworks, massive steelworks. That closed down. Yeah. In my mother's lifetime, if you think about all of those industries and and things that have disappeared, why wouldn't you look at everything that's happened and thought, I can't say with my hand on my heart, despite the fact that I keep being told the country's getting richer, that my life is getting richer. It feels like things are getting worse even though you keep telling me that GDP is on an upward trajectory, it doesn't feel like I am materially better off. So I'm with those people and uh, call it whatever you want, mm. really. I, 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 don't, I don't care. But I suppose the problem sometimes, and I think you pointed out that often the sort of popular side, BNP being an example, um, but also the, the Brexit thing. But I wouldn't say BNP are... Uh, populist. I wouldn't, uh, okay. because they're not popular, right? They, they, I don't think there's a groundswell. In 2009, there was a scare about it. All they did was get him on question time and David yeah. Dimbleby gave him a good see to, and that was it really, mm. uh, so to speak, uh, and uh, asked him a few hard-hitting questions and he wasn't able to answer them. He was like yeah. a, a goldfish out of a bowl. That's true. That's true. Well, Brexit, though, I, I feel like Sometimes with populism, it's it's. I know in Argentina, for example, there was this big promise of football for everyone. Yeah, it was a populist right, yeah. little gambit. We didn't promise that during Brexit, <laughs> <laughs> but they gave it in Argentina for whatever reason because they knew they knew that would be a huge vote winner that people could watch the football. 
uh, because and it had to be on a free TV channel, which was also the government channel, so then they could put in their adverts about the government and all that kind of thing. Um, and that kind of populism. And so with Brexit, there was sort of this thing of that we're going to curb uh, immigration by leaving the EU. But I don't know if that was ever likely to be true. And immigration has gone up, or, or, or should it have been? It, well, it should have been true. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we promised the public. Mm. I, I voted a Conservative in 2019 with gusto. You know, I campaigned for a few of my friends who are now members of parliament, soon not to be. Uh, and I, I was really proud to have been a part of, of helping them. I was really proud of what Boris Johnson said to people and the fact that you know my, my grandfather in, in 2017, trade unionist, labour man, f how could you not be if you worked in, down the pit, right? It came with the territory. He voted, his last vote was 2017 and he voted Conservative for that useless Theresa May. <laughs> And uh, he pulled us to one side and he said, um, I've got something to tell you. And I thought, well, what's this? And uh, he said, I'm going to vote for her. And I said, who's her? He said, I'm going to, because I never expected it would be Theresa May. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to vote uh, conservative for, for that Theresa May. And I, I nearly fell down backwards. And that for me was the start of it, right? That was the realignment happening in real time. Um uh, despite the fact that, as I as I just said, you know, I could you could see it, but I was far too young to understand that things were changing in in that direction. But we promised people that we would give them greater purchase over their lives. That a vote for, at the ballot box, as you've done in 2010, as you've done in 2015, as you've done in 2017, as you've done in 2019, that the pledges and promises that politicians have consistently made to you would be respected at the ballot box and that Brexit mm. would be the tool, the enabler to allow us to actually do that, which is true. Brexit did give us those tools, the flexibility to do that, but we haven't used it, right? We haven't fulfilled that promise. I accept that. In that sense, I guess you could argue, you could say right now that Brexit has been a failure, but I would also argue that Brexit hasn't been delivered mm. um, in, in a meaningful sense, because we've said to everyone, you know, come here, study, bring over every Tom, Dick and Harry that you want to. Uh, I even saw some stats saying that people from India, which has a space program, you know, they're coming over in small boats and you just think... We have gone so far beyond, and I know that's a, there's a difference between legal and illegal immigration, of course, mm. uh, but both have gone up, right? Both have massively gone up uh, at, to record levels. Uh, the ONS figures were down this year and Rishi Sunak said, oh, goody, goody, look what I've managed to do. I think they'll be revised because the ONS did this last year. That's the official stats uh, accountant, I guess. And... Uh, they revised last year's to record levels, and I think I think uh, or the year before rather, and I think last year's will be the same. They'll be revised and say, "Oh, look at all those people we missed." Um, oh, quite possibly, I'm sure. But a lot of people are annoyed, going, "Well, look, we were getting immigration from. If we're going to have to have it, which it seems that government after government is insisting we do for whatever reason, it might be, I suppose, to uh, help with the aging population and to just have a sort of stopgap and just fill with young workers. People would prefer to have from Europe, where they have maybe more similar." social cohesion and things to what we have here? Well, I mean, the language barrier still applies to yeah. some parts of Europe. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I don't think that was the ever the, the issue, really. I think the issue, why are we not paying care workers in this country a wage that's livable? Why are we not saying to them, you do something that is incredibly difficult? Like being a carer is not a walk in the park. Looking after someone at their most vulnerable is incredibly difficult. Uh, oh, yeah. And we pay them a pittance. Uh, um, and I think that's totally unacceptable. But business, and there, there will be the, uh, care homes that operate as businesses, of course, who have been allowed to have a free lunch from mass migration have said, oh, goody, goody, let's just get people from elsewhere. Why bother with the native population and have to maybe pay them wages mm. and they'll unionize and it'll just be very annoying. Let's not bother with that. And we've just said, we'll not bother. So when people say to me, oh, well, the care sector, you know, wages will have to go up. I remember Stuart Rose, he was, used to be the uh, chairman of the CEO of Marks and Spencer. And he said during the EU referendum, wages would go up. And he said that as if like that was a reason not to vote leave. Interesting. And I just thought, 
you that you are so naive, you are so completely out of touch that you've no idea what you've just said. Well, one is incredibly helpful to the Brexit argument, but secondly, part of a wider systemic problem that we simply do not value the people we're already meant to care for the most in the world, and instead just say, well, there's this open market that we've got unfettered access to, so let's bring those people over and to hell with the Brits.